Gracious Lord, may only your word be spoken here, and may only your word be received. Amen. Please be seated. What do you all do on a special day? Well, most of us share a special meal with somebody, with our friends or our family. Birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. We gather together for lunch, brunch, dinner, sometimes even supper. Most special meals are in remembrance or celebration of a special someone or someones or a special occasion. Sometimes we make the mistake of prioritizing the food and drink over the person or the event. It's not about the anniversary. I mean, it's not about the champagne. It's about the anniversary. It's not about the cake. It's about the birthday girl. But there's an entire industry and thousands and thousands of cooking shows that try to impress upon us the importance of the food and the drink. And sometimes it is indeed quite important. After all, as Tolkien uh, put it in describing the hobbits, those great lovers of second breakfasts and elevenses, if more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. And indeed it would. I'm here to tell you today that sometimes it's okay and actually necessary to prioritize the meal. And we're on the luck because today is one of those occasions and the meal that follows this sermon is one of those meals. Our first reading describes the Passover, a day of remembrance for the whole congregation of Israel. God commands his people to celebrate it annually as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. In and through this cyclical remembrance of the Passover, Israel is united with God in his eternity. They become his people anew by renewing their contact with God through this meal. Over and over again in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, we are taught that the Passover is an ordinance for all God's people forever. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. In the book of Numbers, the Lord declares to Moses that anyone who refrains from keeping the Passover shall be cut off from the people of God. There are few, if any, greater sins in the entire Old Testament than the failure to keep the feast. And this Passover is always to be observed communally, not individually. Families are to consume the lamb together one whole lamb for each household. For those whose households are too small, those without families, they are to join with their neighbors and each is to receive a share of the one lamb. Now the lamb is to be eaten by all of Israel at exactly the same time and in exactly the same way, roasted over a fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This simultaneous shared meal is what constitutes, is what creates the congregation of Israel. Later in the same chapter, we're told that a mixed multitude of people went up out of Egypt and out of slavery together. This mixed multitude of humanity is knit together as one people of God, journeying together with God through the wilderness for 40 years and towards the promised land. So Passover is not just some memorial. It is the real occasion on which God delivers his people out of slavery and makes them his own people. Most of our own celebratory meals are to remember something in the past or someone or some event. They point to something that's more important than food and drink, sure, they look backwards, they're mere memorials. But here in the Passover, the meal is the point. Passover points backwards, 
but it also points to something going on in the present and points forward to something even better. It is the literal passing over of Lord's judgment from his chosen people. It is that which constitutes and reconstitutes over and over the community of God. Now this reality doesn't always align with our own modern sensibilities. It feels ancient and alien. However, even moderns like us sometimes recognize that there's something special about a good meal, something that somehow brings people together and even transforms us. Virginia Woolf noted that one cannot think well, love well, or sleep well unless one dines well. Even that great cynic Oscar Wilde once quipped that after a good dinner, one can forgive anybody, even your close relations. <laughs> These are very dim glimpses of the reality that the Passover meal is not just ancient, it is eternal, and it isn't alien at all, it is transcendent. That reality has been revealed to us, the people of God, through Jesus Christ. Jesus, the most faithful of all Jews, kept the Passover. By celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples during the Passover, Jesus revealed the true meaning of this feast, the true nature of the Passover. As he declared in St. John's Gospel, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. The Lamb is the central focus of this Passover feast. And yet, in all four of the Gospel narratives, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there is no mention of any roasted lamb on the table. Nothing boiled, nothing roasted, not even raw. Bread, sure, and wine, okay, but no lamb. If I were one of the disciples at that Last Supper, I would be outraged. What is a Passover without a roasted lamb? That's like a birthday party with no cake, Thanksgiving with no turkey, what is the world coming to? Right? All order is breaking down. Okay? But I would be mistaken. And if the disciples were that outraged, they would be mistaken. Because there is a lamb at the Last Supper. There is no lamb on the table, but there is a lamb at the table. And he is presiding over the entire meal. We know that Christ is the Lamb who is at the table because all of Scripture points to this gracious reality. The story of the whole Bible is the story of the Lamb from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis 22, God provides the Lamb for Abraham to sacrifice instead of Isaac. In Isaiah 53, the suffering servant is the Lamb that is led to slaughter. In St. John's Gospel, John the Baptist declares that behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In the book of Revelation, we are promised that the final victory over sin and death will be won by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb on the doorposts and on the lintels saved the Israelites from slavery. The blood of Christ shed on the cross saves us from sin and death. As St. Augustine put it, the doorposts of the Jews were marked with the blood of a slaughtered animal. Our foreheads are marked with the blood of Christ. The sign of Christ drives the destroyer away from us insofar as our hearts receive the Savior. So all of us, you and me, we have been given the gift of the bread of life, the blood of the Lamb, and every day we can consume the flesh of the Lamb, the flesh of the Word of God. We consume it through the reading and proclamation of the audible Word of God and through the reception of the edible Word of God, the sacrament of communion. And we are to consume the whole Word, 
without exclusion. God commands Israel to eat the entire lamb, its head, its legs, and inner organs. Let none of it remain until morning. Very too often, we are fussy eaters. We're picky. We choose what we want to consume, we receive the parts of scripture that we like, and we reject the rest. But all of scripture is a witness to Christ. The entire Bible is the story, the good news of the lamb who died on the cross for us. So this meal, this feast, the audible and edible word of God transforms us because it is through it that we receive Christ's body and blood. Through it, we enter into an intimate communal union with Christ himself. Oscar Wilde might, might have been speaking a deeper truth than he realized or cared to admit. Through our shared meal, our excellent feast, we can forgive one another because Christ forgives us first. We can forgive even our most intimate relations, as Wilde put, because Christ first loved us. It is Christ who forgives, Christ who fills me with the Spirit, Christ who bids me to be ready to participate in his ministry, loins girded, staff in hand, sandals tied, ready to go. Our shared meal today that we will partake in together at the altar is just like a birthday or an anniversary or a holiday in that it is about a special person and about persons and a special event. The person at the center of our meal is Christ. The persons are us, the church, the body of Christ. And the event is our salvation and reception as the people of God. Perhaps today I should also add that our sharing today is twofold, one here at the altar and the other out in the courtyard. Instead of flame roasted lamb, we will receive the body and the blood of Christ here and then flame roasted burger patties outside. As a bonus, instead of unleavened bread and bitter herbs, we get leavened burger buns and sweet ice cream. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Now, both of our shared meals, here and outside, they bind us together in different ways. But it is the meal here at the altar, the body and the blood of Christ, that makes all of it possible, that constitutes us as the people of God. Every single excellent earthly meal that we have ever had, everything from a Jamaican beef patty to a seven-course French dinner, as delicious as they each are, all of them point us towards something better and greater and higher, towards a feast that we can't possibly imagine. And so the meal is the point. We certainly aren't here to hear me talk, not even to hear me talk about a meal, but we are here for the meal, the supper of the lamb. The communion feast that we all share today is a foretaste of the divine reality that we have all already been given. The Anglican priest Robert Farrar Capon wrote a number of books, one of which is a cookbook entitled The Supper of the Lamb, and he describes Christ's transcendent grace in this way. For all its greatness, the created order cries out for further greatness still. The most splendid dinner, the most exquisite food, the most gratifying company arouse more appetites than they can satisfy. They do not slake man's thirst for being, they wet it beyond all bounds. All tastes fade, of course, but not the taste for greatness they inspire. Each love escapes us, but not the longing it provokes for a better convivium a higher session. It is our glory to thirst until Jerusalem comes home at last. So eat well then. Between our love and his priesthood, Christ makes all things new, and our last home will be home indeed.
For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast on this day and into eternity. Amen.